This evening, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Sarah White. Sarah is a senior associate at the Center on Wisconsin Strategy, a national policy center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, dedicated to high road economic development. Her work focuses on the intersection of labor, education, and energy policy. And she is a national expert on jobs and training in the emerging green economy. She has written widely on education for sustainability, including most recently, Greener Reality, Resilience, Equity, and Skill Formation in a Cleaner U.S. Economy. Sarah chairs the National Working Group on Solar Career Pathways for the U.S. Department of Energy and served as the Secretary's Policy Advisor for Federal Pro Employment and Training Programs at Wisconsin's Department of Workforce Development. A labor historian and Fulbright Scholar, she holds a PhD from Columbia University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah White. Wow, good evening everyone. Thank you so much for being here on a snowy night. Um, I'm a Midwesterner. I grew up in Minnesota, so this feels like home. Really, this isn't snow at all, so I'm not sure what the worry's about, but um, hopefully it won't come down more, and I appreciate you being here, those of you who are here by choice. Um, <laughs> the first thing you should know about me uh, is not that I have a fancy degree, because a lot of people uh, do or will have. Um, but uh, I'm a fast talker, so you have to keep up. I'm, you'll see on the video that Billy Parrish, who's gonna talk next, is a very slow talker. So he will give you your Zen talk, and I'm gonna talk fast so I can say more in a shorter amount of time. Um, so I just should say, first of all, that um, I wanted to thank uh, everyone who's invited me here, uh, the Sustainability Center here uh, at McHenry, uh, the uh, President Vicki Smith and everyone on the Bioneers Committee. It really is an honor to be here uh, and to talk about the little bit that I know and to learn more from all of the things that you all are doing here, which has been tremendously exciting. So let me say, although um, my title, if I can remember it, green means go, jobs, renewable energy, and the future of power. I want to say first up, um, I'm not gonna give you a bunch of stats about renewables. Uh, those are all online and not really worth a snowstorm for you to hear from me. Um, also, you have some great experts on campus, Kim Hankins and uh, Ted Erske, two of many, who know way more about the nuts and bolts of renewable energy and other forms of energy. Um, so you have great resources here um, and in many of the reports um, that we have put out uh, in my office. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about clean energy um, in the context of sustainable economic development. Um, I'm going to talk about the choices we make and that we can make about our energy future together. And I'm going to talk not so much about how to get a good green job, but how to create the kind of society that has those jobs. Okay, so first let me say a quick word about where I come from. Cows. This is us, Center on Wisconsin Strategy. Um, Wisconsin Strategy is not uh, a strategy for developing the state of Wisconsin. It simply refers back to the Wisconsin idea, uh, which was part of the founding of the University of Wisconsin, uh, which is that, um, that academics should be fully engaged in community life and not writing for other academics, but actually working in the community. So what we do is we work on three issues. We work on sustainability, we work on equity, and we work on democracy across a range of issues. Personally, I work a lot on um, technical and community college education and the way it intersects with clean energy and with a, a greener economy. Uh, so we write, we do a lot of research, and we build partnerships. We work with community colleges, we work with the federal government, state government, local government, we work with labor unions, we work with environmental groups, we work with businesses and employers and community groups. We build coalitions to try and come together to figure out how to build a greener economy. That's what I do. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my work tonight, um, if I can remember where my clicker is. Okay. So, I want to talk about the green economy. Um, people associate green with a regulatory framework 
or some kind of energy infrastructure, uh, which is at odds with economic growth. And I am here tonight to tell you that that is just not true, that the call for sustainability is not, as some people will tell you, a red light, but it is a call to action, and it is a model for shared prosperity. Green means go. So first, let me say a quick word about the term uh, green and the term sustainability. Um, I find, I know that's not true here in this room because I know you have a strategic plan, but in many corners of the world, if you say sustain sustainability, the typical response is, huh? Because um, it's confusing, right? It's a catch-all term. And I'm sure you've discussed it a time or two here. Um, I know that this country was convulsed for the past six years or eight years or ten years trying to define green jobs. And then this thing happened that we can talk more about where Congress had this amazing moment of colorblindness where they thought that green jobs were part of a red scare. And because it was all part of some crazy lefty communist plot, they decided that most green-related programs should be cut. So. I want you to know that the communications gurus and the philanthropic world and a lot of the policy wonks say, we can't say green anymore. I'm glad that you haven't gotten that message, but we can say sustainability. And that always kills me because it's not as if sustainability is any clearer than green. That's why this is my favorite painting. This is a green target by Jasper Johns. And I think this is about as clear as we get with sustainability and green. We have to define what that means for us and our future and our community. There's no one definition of sustainability. But let me offer you some parameters for what I'm going to talk about tonight. And when I think of sustainability, I want to keep it simple. I think of two things. I think, first of all, environmentally. How can we live together? How can we prosper as a community without exceeding the caring capacity of the planet? And the second part that I think we often forget is social and economic, right? So how can we live together? How can we prosper without oppressing our fellow earthlings or at least driving uh, our neighbors crazy? Right? So this is something to think about. And I think I'm going to take a minute here, uh, if you will, to uh, set the economic stage. Because while it's hard to say sometimes exactly what sustainability looks like, it is easy to show what is not sustainable. And while I think a lot of people say that clean energy just isn't affordable yet, I think it's pretty easy to show the bankruptcy of a carbon-based economy. So in, in 2012, um, the United States government spent $136 billion <laughs> on climate-related weather events, droughts, wildfires, storms, flooding. That's wildfire, not wildflowers. Um, and I want to say that does not include any private expenditure, any insurance payouts. That's just government spending. And I also should point out that um, the projections for the tar sands in Alberta, um, the revenue from that is supposed to bring the Canadian government uh, $123 billion over the course of 20 years. We spent $136 billion government dollars in one year on disaster-related recoveries. And for those of you who don't really want to talk about climate change, that's fine. Uh, we don't have to talk about extreme weather. We can talk about garden variety air pollution, the old-fashioned kind. That costs us $120 billion annually in health expenditures on related illnesses. It's very expensive, this carbon-based economy. Um, another thing, uh, Superstorm Sandy, this is 11 billion gallons of sewage, raw sewage, moving up the coast of New York. Okay, it was the largest storm to hit the Northeast. We all saw it in the papers. Maybe you know people who experienced it. Um, it killed 159 people. It knocked out power to millions. It caused about $70 billion in damage, eight states, and it put right at the fork, the, um, the critical vulnerability of our infrastructure. You know, it paralyzed all transit, it flooded hospitals, it crippled electrical substations, it shut down power and water to tens of millions of people. And one of the larger pieces that is less appreci appreciated is the failure of sewage treatment, of sewage overflow. And I think that solar and wind are much sexier to talk about but really, we need to think about waste and we need to think about water when we're talking about sustainable economic development. Here's another thing. Um, abnormal weather like this is the new normal, right? So we know that billion dollar events touched 67% of US counties last year. Um, you know, you see levees fail in more dramatic examples in New Orleans or seas rising in Norfolk or wildfires, wildfires out west. Um, dust bullification, tornadoes wipe out towns. In all of these events, 
One of the um, casualties that doesn't get talked about a lot is small business. One out of three businesses do not make it. So worrying about clean economies is no longer just for tree huggers, right? This is a business question. We also need to have some perspective. Um, uh, I think just as climate and weather-related events look different everywhere, um, the response to it, whether we're talking about mitigation or adaptation, looks different everywhere in every community. Um, building, a clean, building a green infrastructure and a clean energy economy is not the same everywhere and for everyone, but we really need to be honest about its limits. So the green economy is not going to reopen mills, it is not going to put factories back online, it is not going to save displaced workers from uh, fossil fuel industries, it's not going to magically make your community a clean tech corridor. Right? This is work. You can't just hope for green answers as silver bullets. This is what happened to us over the last decade. Um, you can't just hope it will bring good jobs because it's green. Uh, we need to build this in from the start. So I just encourage you that you can't talk about green or sustainability without talking about economic opportunity and democratization without developing community and worker institutions that work with government and businesses and education. It's not just about training. It's not just about jobs in one sector. You need to come together, as I think all of you are starting to do, and ask, what does our common energy future look like? And the only thing I think that's certain about that is uncertainty. So, we live in a world that's dominated by uncertainty, right? We don't know what the labor market's going to look like. We don't know what skills we'll need entirely. We don't know what politics are going to end up being. Um, we used to think nature was a little predictable. Tides, even river flooding, periodic. But now we know water goes out in some places. This is Texas. We know water comes in. In other places, this is New York. We don't know when the disaster is going to strike or which one, but we know that soon and somewhere near you, there's going to be a natural disaster. And communities who have what we call adaptive capacity, in other words, the communities who survive this and prosper and thrive, what are they doing differently? What can you do differently so that you can respond when this comes to your neighborhood? Right? This has to do with a lot of things. It has to do with education, it has to do with energy and water and health and transit, um, but it really has to do with skills and human capital, which I'm going to talk about um, in a minute. But I want to say about that that there's one other thing that's really unsustainable, and that's this. Sustainability Whoops. is also an economic question, right? So we have a nine million uh, jobs deficit in this country. What I mean by that is to return to pre-recession job employment levels. 2007, we would need to add 9 million more jobs. That means the number of jobs, what this is showing you, that were lost during the recession, and in addition to that, the number of jobs to keep up with population growth. We have 9 million fewer jobs than we had in 2007. This is a crisis that we have to think about. Um, Illinois is running at the sixth highest of 50 states in its jobs deficit. There's 300,000 jobs um, that you need to add to get to 2007, um, 2007 levels. So, um, look, we have unprecedented levels of long-term unemployment. Um, the lack of jobs is unsustainable. It's unsustainable for families. It's unsustainable for communities. And so I think when we're thinking about green economic development, we really have to think about jobs and quality jobs and employment. It's important to put those two things together. But enough doom and gloom. So I think that tonight and next Tuesday night and for the rest of the month and for the years to come, that we have to be moving forward every day in our cities and in our states um, to stop talking like I'm doing about the end of the world, right? We have to start talking about creating a new one. We need to green everything, right? And the good news is that you can start anywhere. Um, we, the goal, though, is to do this systematically and to do it at scale. So you need to mitigate, you need to stop doing the stuff that's wrecking the planet and wrecking the economy, and you need to adapt. You need to figure out how you're going to handle the disaster when it comes. Renewables are a big part of this, right? Both, you might think about, um, you know, going off-grid in a disaster and adaptive strategies to have microgrids, solar power, um, uh, and also they help us with uh, mitigation, right, which is spewing less carbon into the atmosphere. But you need to think about some considerations in doing this. There's all kinds of ways you can build this green economy um, in and outside of the energy sector. 
it's important to think about scale. You can do this, you can do this. This is my personal favorite. This is a green roof on a doghouse. I'm thinking about building this. Um, this is a solar farm. <laughs> You know, so you can do both things and you should do both things. Um, we can do renewable energy and we can do green infrastructure. We can do it in our backyards. We can do it at our state capitals. Uh, the question is figuring out what are the policies and the partnerships we need to build to do both. Um, which one is going to create more jobs? In some cases, uh, you know, you might not create a lot of jobs, but you might increase the quality of life and reduce the cost of living. That's very important. Backyard matters as much as utility scale, right? Distributed generation. We can talk about this in questions. It is the hottest, most contested trend in renewable energy today, and the future kind of depends on how that shakes out. Who controls energy? Where is it located? Who makes money from it? How is it distributed? Um, and on the infrastructure side of things, green infrastructure, this is huge. This is not just energy, um, but this is water. This is jobs in civil engineering and design and public works, or it could be a mom and pop landscaping shop that's figuring out how to do bioswales, right? There is room across the green economy. The other thing to think about, sexiness. I know this is not a social scientific category, but I don't know a better word for it because here's the deal. Everybody wants this. Everybody needs this, right? So, you know, what gets the immediate returns, right? Um, you know, what's practical? There are going to be a lot more HVAC jobs uh, than wind techs, and you're going to get a lot further convincing people to save energy in their houses than to um, have a siting fight about wind turbines, right? So we need to think about all of these things. And it's also important to remember, energy efficiency, we say renewables, we say renewable energy, we forget to include energy efficiency. Right? Almost 50% of energy consumption in this country goes to heating and lighting homes and buildings. More than transportation, more than industry. Energy efficiency is not sexy, but wrapping your hot water heater is a big part of the answer to the planet. It's that simple. It's that ugly. Um, man. Okay, the last thing. Well, not the last thing, but the last thing I'm going to say before I talk even faster. Um, you have to think about in making these choices is impact, right? We love this, right? We love urban agriculture, food, local food initiatives, moving from, you know, whether it's community gardens and backyard chicken coops or regional food hubs, it lowers the cost of living, it raises the quality of living, it, um, it creates local jobs, gives healthy communities, it's great training opportunities, but frankly, it's not gonna help with this. Right? It's part of the answer, but it's not the whole answer. So let me give you um, a few words from the trenches thinking about green jobs, just in case there's any confusion. Green jobs for a decade are what I call, were for what I call Martian jobs, right? We have to be very careful talking about green jobs in the green economy because some people believe that green jobs were some new set of different exotic jobs that were gonna be delivered unto us, that would be done by little green men and it would look all new and all different. And then it turned out that actually it was mostly the jobs we already knew, right? They had some green skills added on. It was not a whole new set of jobs. So look, so we had this fight, right? This huge national political fight in which the naysayer said, see, there's no such thing as green jobs. See, it was all, it was all fake. Um, you know, and the fabulous said, you know, green is going to save us from a world recession. And that didn't happen either, right? So we have to think honestly about the potential of jobs. There could be hundreds of millions of jobs in clean energy, but we have to have the politics and the policies and the market symbols signals in place to build that economy for those jobs to come through. Um, you say I want a green job, what does that look like? That looks like a hospital housekeeper who's using a different mop, it looks like a plumber with solar skills, it looks like industrial engineers figuring out how to reorganize their paper mills to use their own waste for heat and power, it looks like that bunch of delinquent kids who you wrote off as trouble replanting an urban forest to make your city a better place to live. That's what green jobs look like. It does not look 
like some crazy thing you've never seen before. It is bus drivers, it is train operators, it is more than 3.5 million Americans right now who are working across every sector in and outside of energy. And most of these jobs, I might say, are at associates or journey level, so that is good news for this institution. I want to say a quick word about the blue-green vision. I want to make sure that everyone in this room leaves knowing the story of Teamsters and Turtles because it's part of the history of green jobs that everyone should know. Um, uh, and it's because we're still having this discussion. You will still find in your community and in national discussions and in your state houses and in your city councils um, this idea that, and in your chambers of commerce, right, that, well, we'd love to go green, but really it'll kill the jobs. There's no jobs out there. Well, you know, that is not true. And the, one of the first places we realized this was at the, the WTO protests in Seattle in 1999. And I don't often show these pictures. I don't have these pictures because they're disturbing to some people because they're riots, right? But what happens is that uh, the longshoremen close the port of Seattle because they think that international trade agreements are going to send their jobs overseas, and they're going to be stuck doing crappy dead-end service jobs when they have good family-supporting jobs. So the Teamsters are marching in the streets, you know, good old-fashioned blue-collar labor unions. And the Sierra Club has organized also because they're aware that international treaties are not going to honor uh, pacts that they have developed to, pr to protect wildlife and forests and things that are important uh, to big greens. And so there's this great moment where there's sort of this tear gas and there's all these kids in turtle costumes and there's these big burly steel workers and transit dudes and, uh, and they're marching together. And they're like, wait a minute, we're, we're enemies. Like, we're killing my jobs, you know? It's like chocolate, peanut butter, it doesn't work, whatever. They, um, they, they realized that they were allies. And so ever since, there's been this attempt to say that together we are stronger. We can have good jobs and we can have a clean environment. And what does that look like? Let's build that together. And we've been doing this. We at COWS, together with hundreds of organizations around the country, have been working on this, including not just labor and not just environmentalists, but businesses and employers and public officials and colleges and community groups. So there is a way forward, and there's a long history behind this argument. It is not true that there are not jobs, and there are a lot of people across the political spectrum trying to show um, that this is possible. You know, and the other thing I want to say here is that it's easy on the green side to dismiss the job worries um, of other folks, but we can't do that either, right? Because if you're talking about a construction laborer out west who can make $25 an hour laying down a pipeline, and his or her alternative is to earn a poverty level wage at McDonald's, who can blame them for wanting a pipeline to come through their community, right? We don't live in their shoes. So the trick is to find something different. And actually, there's a study just released this week that shows that um, for a fraction of the investment, well, a big investment, but not as much of an investment, um, the uh, in the communities where the Keystone Pipeline is proposed to go through, if we spent that money rebuilding infrastructure, and not even fancy green infrastructure, but roads and bridges and water pipes that we need, you could create twice as many jobs and well-paying jobs. So we have alternatives. We can't present people with unsustainable alternatives. You shouldn't do that because it's not good for the planet. It has to be good for families, too. So. That's a lot of history and big picture. And I'd like to say a few things about what this might look like at a community level, um, if federal policy and federal activism seems a little remote. So there are any number of ways, um, any number of economic sectors, any number of economic needs or regional priorities or curricular priorities um, that we could focus on. Right? So the original focus of all this green stuff was renewable energy and energy efficiency, with a focus largely on manufacturing and construction jobs, and there are a lot of those. But the new, new green economy brings back in air and water and waste and ecosystem services, um, most of which are local and labor intensive. So in your communities, you can think about water systems, food systems, health, 
transit, education, there's a million things, and energy. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about energy, give you one example, um, but just be aware that this is part of a much larger, greener context, right? Energy isn't just about wind and solar. Green isn't just about wind and solar. So, uh, people say, how can we build solar in our community? I know that um, here in McHenry County uh, and uh, here at the college, there have been some great initiatives, and so I sort of feel like, wow, well, I want to come here and do a case study of you all. I don't need to tell you how to do this. You're already doing it, so bravo to all of you. Um, but here's, here's what it looks like. Here's the practical, tactical meat of it, right? We're all excited about solar, so how do we do it? Right, so I have a short list for you. There are five ways to move solar forward. And by the way, this is also how you move geothermal. This is how you move food systems. This is how you move whatever is near and dear to you. So the first thing you do is you need to convene and agree on community-wide goals, right? This seems obvious, but you come up with a short list, right? Why does solar matter? Some people will come for the environmental reasons. Some people will come for the jobs. Some will come for the economic argument. You have to lay out the case and then once you've got that in place, you lead by example. And what this means is that municipalities or organizations, and I mean cities and companies and schools, um, or small business centers, for example, uh, install solar. You be an advocate by acting. You walk the walk, right? This is what McHenry is doing, um, I understand, with the new project to put solar panels um, uh, around the small, small business center. I think I'm saying that correctly. Um, the other thing, the really important thing to do is get out of the way. People always forget this one, right? And mostly I'm speaking to government here. Like I'm a fan of government, really, um, as part of my work, but you need to review your building, your zoning, your neighborhood ordinances to make sure that government is not in the way of solar development. The government needs to be there to regulate things, absolutely, to guarantee consumer safety, and public health, um, but there's a lot of hidden obstacles. I know that there's a lot of hidden obstacles. You think there's hidden obstacles developing backyard chicken coops? Just wait till you try and start a solar garden for your community. There's a lot to be done. So, the other thing you do is after you get out of the way, if that's you, is you help, right? So this is government, this is community groups. There needs to be a lot of technical assistance out there. I know that MREA, the Midwest Renewable Energy Association, who are my colleagues, who I adore, by the way, have been here uh, doing a lot of solar uh, technical assistance. This is really just, what are the advantages of solar? How do you do it? What does the funding look like? What does the finance look like? Do we do leases, community solar, revolving loan funds? There's a million ways to do this. People need to know. People are scared. They think, I can't afford that. As you will hear from Billy Parrish in the video shortly, um, you know, there are lots of ways to do this, but people don't know what they are. People don't have time to do all the research. So if you're an advocate, figure it out. Translate it into a language that people understand. And then the last thing is that you really have to think harder about jobs. And there are two things in the solar industry and across all green industries that we think about with jobs. Quality work, and quality jobs. These are not the same things. So um, everyone from government to businesses to training providers have a role here. And this means um, quality work is critical to the success of the industry. So Berkeley did a study three years ago now of energy efficiency measures uh, across California. And they found that um, in the majority of cases, not even a fraction of the efficiency gains were realized. So again, there's potential there, but you know what they found? Nobody was monitoring the work. There were in many cases sort of fly-by-night companies going up, taking rolls of insulation, putting them in the attic and taping the attic door shut. That doesn't work. And then there were better intentioned people who just didn't know how to do it properly. So they were, uh, you know, rehamming, they were retrofitting, they were making energy efficient, neighborhoods and communities on a massive scale, they poured a lot of money into it, <laughs> and they got almost none of the efficiency gains because the work was not done well. And this is where training is so very important, right? So you need a skilled workforce to do this stuff. You know, it has to work right. Um, it's a little bit scarier with solar because, you know, you burn down a house and then nobody really believes in solar for about 20 years. That's what happened in the 70s. Um, so the other thing is... Um, quality jobs, and this is also critical to the success 
of a community. Because nobody wants a solar sweatshop, right? Some solar jobs look like hot, unheated assembly warehouses in the desert where people are stapling together cheap components. That is not the kind of solar industry that you want in your community, right? So are people doing quality work and do they have quality jobs? We think about all of those things. And I think it's also important um, to keep in mind what solar jobs actually look like. Uh, this is a tool that cows and a series of subject matter experts around the country developed for the U.S. Department of Energy. It's an online interactive career map. Uh, it's surprisingly, mm, I don't know how to say this politely, it is surprisingly not technologically advanced for something put out by the United States Department of Energy um, as far as websites go, because there's lots of regulations. But it is a cool tool. You float over these bubbles. It will give you lines showing all the other jobs you can go to. And it's just important to remember, I think if anything, you can use this tool and you can go find it, Solar Career Map, search for it at the Department of Energy, um, to show that there are jobs in the, you know, you think solar, you think, I think it's a woman in a hard hat up on a roof, right? And yeah, there's roofers and there's solar installers and there's construction managers and there are uh, technicians and carpenters, but there are also rocket scientists and material scientists and energy technicians and CNC manufacturing jobs. There are site assessors, there are entry level, there are middle skill level, there are associates level and PhD level jobs across the sectors. There is sales and marketing, there is decommissioning, there is design, there is research, there is production. There are so many jobs in the solar industry. I can't even begin to imagine. This could touch every area of your life. Right? And this has an impact when we think about skills and training, right? Because nobody trains to be a solar engineer unless they're in some kind of crazy program, which they shouldn't be in. Um, you train to be an engineer, and then you figure out how solar systems work, and you add those skills on, right? So at community colleges, I talked a lot of, to a lot of people today um, here at uh, McHenry County Community Colleges who are doing great work, doing what we wish the rest of the country was doing, which is not set up separate specialized programs of study, but integrate solar skills and other kinds of skills that are green across the curriculum. Because not everyone's gonna come out of community college with a solar job waiting for them. But they might have a job which, you know, 2% or 50% or 75% of their job requires those solar skills. And they might get a higher place in an interview schedule because they have those additional skills, right? So we need these skills added on to traditional programs of study, not set up separately. Um, I should give you these, um, these statistics. As a social scientist, I hate sort of summarizing things neatly, um, but I will give you some fun statistics because it is night and a snowstorm and you deserve it. So um, I will say that uh, there are more workers in the solar industry in the United States than there are in the coal industry. It seems to surprise people. Um, there are more solar geeks in California than people in the movie industry. Right? The solar industry employs more people in California. And in Texas, this maybe is my favorite. You think Texas looks like this, really? You think people are ranchers. More of them are doing this. I love that thing. That's so cool, right? Um, it almost makes me want to be an engineer. <laughs> Um, there are more people working in the solar industry in Texas than there are in ranchers. More solar installers than cowboys. This is what America looks like now, right? But it's still tiny. These numbers are a little bit outdated, but they've only changed a little bit. The difference is that we have a little bit less coal, a little bit more natural gas, but the point is that uh, renewable energy as a whole is only 9% of our total energy pie. This could be carved up many ways, and I won't bore you with the varieties of that, but it's important to note, even on here, solar, 1%, 1% of the 9% of the entire energy pie. Think of the potential. The National Renewable Energy Laboratory has shown in study after study that on the grid that we have, 
we could go to 100% renewable energy if we also brought to scale our efficiency measures by 2050. Think of the jobs that could create. Think of the clean communities that could create. You know, there's a lot of ways we could get there, but it's a, it's a heavy lift, right? We've got a long way to go. Uh, also, the other thing to think about jobs is that, so last year, wind and solar were the fastest growing segments of any energy production in the United States and adding the most jobs. But again, think of it in the context. It's a tiny part of the whole. So how do we get there? How do we get it into the green? How do we do it 100%? We do this um, together. We don't do it alone. Um, we don't want to be Pollyannas, but change is coming, and we can figure out how to do it. So I leave you with a couple thoughts. Um, I think it's really important that you think more broadly, that, you, that we think more broadly about clean energy as climate mitigation. I think we have to think about resilient communities. I know you're gonna talk about that in one of these sessions in a couple weeks. You're gonna hear a lot about resilience in the months and years to come, if you haven't heard about it already. And so there is a shock coming. There is a dark time coming, right? Asthma rates skyrocketing, bridges are collapsing, seas are rising, California is gonna run out of water next month. We think that we're all set with the Great Lakes, but have you seen what's happened in Central Asia to their lakes? Um, but here's the hope. We have resilience. We have adaptive capacity. Think not just about ecosystems, think about economies, right? So think about resilience. People will tell you that resilience, it's an engineering term, right? That you can give something a terrible shock and it will return to its original state. But I would argue that in the sustainability context, we don't want to return to our original state. We don't want to return to high unemployment. We don't want to return to dirty communities. We don't want to return to the kinds of cities where poor people live by all the toxic dumps, right? We don't want to return to places where middle-class families are struggling to get by. We want something better. And how do we get that? It's not about what we do with our utilities. It is about choice. It is about the future of power. Three things, right? I want you to think not about power as in lights and charging your phone. I want you to think about power as in your voice and your community and your ability to choose your own energy future because, and I can't stress this enough, we have the technology to go renewable. We could do it with our current transmission system, as I've mentioned. This is a political choice. Um, and in the end, resilience, climate change, all of these issues, these are not about investing in any particular energy system or any particular adaptive equipment. It's not about building seawalls, it's not about building microgrids, it's not about green infrastructure, it's about human capital, which is our skills and abilities collectively and together. And by human capital, I don't mean a workforce with skills to blow insulation incorrectly or to install solar panels. Um, I'm talking about skills for leadership and skills for partnership. And you know, we have studied this for decades and we have found that there are three things which build resilient communities, right? In the faces of, in the face of things like climate change, inequality, huge challenges. One is that is worker voice. So democracy is not a value. It is something that creates value. We found throughout the recession that in businesses where workers and management work together, they weathered the recession better than businesses where this was not true. That high productivity is good for business. We found another thing is that we have to think about reducing the cost of living, right? Because of some world economic trends, which I am not going to tell you, <laughs> wages may not rise significantly in the future. So we don't want to reduce our standard of living, but we might have to think about building cleaner and more affordable communities so that we can live with less and still live well. And also, by the way, and I hope you address this next year, we have to have a serious conversation about growth and about defining quality of life that does not involve buying more stuff, right? That's another conversation, but something to think about. Um, you know, we don't use renewable energy to keep our houses at 50 degrees during a drought, right? These are questions. Um, and the last thing I want to say is just a shout out to democracy, right? We have a real democracy deficit in this country right now. And by this, I do not mean challenges to voters' rights. I do not mean big D democratic politics at all. 
I mean that people in many places have lost the faith in their power and their capacity to actually change the institutions where they work, where they play, where they learn, where they live, where they vote. Yes, that too. And I think that this is, you know, it's really critical to our future. We have to somehow re teach and regain this understanding of voice and leadership. And those are skills that are as important as the technical skills we're talking about, right? We have to recreate a culture of public goods, right? That air and water matter too, right? Libraries and green spaces and fire departments and street lights and schools, when did those become burdens? I mean, those are some things we need to think about. And so I wanna leave you in case you think that I'm a raving lunatic. I know I can't change your minds now. <laughs> I want to leave you with words from, of all places, the governor, former governor of Wyoming. Okay, this is a state that's built on extractive industries, right? This guy is wearing a bolo. He was scary to me in all kinds of ways. He, um, he got up and he said at a national adaptation forum on climate change, he said, you know, Back there in Washington, D.C., he calls it Fedlandia. <laughs> Fedlandia, they think community is a bunch of people living in close proximity to each other that you can make do something. He's like, I'm here to tell you differently. Where I come from, community is a group of very, very different individuals with completely different interests who are bending together towards some kind of common purpose. Now that, to me, that sounds like sustainability. And that, I think, is the future of power, right? That's a greener future. So I say, are you ready? Green means go. Let's build it. That's what I got. Thanks. Ready for anyone who might have a question? Yes, sir. Hi. A lot of uh, solar panels have been kind of offshored the production to China. It was all developed mm -hmm. here. And a lot of businesses over time try and reduce the amount of labor. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason to think that will not happen with green industries, or will it hang on to jobs better than traditional manufacturing, say? Right. That's a huge question. I mean, one of the reasons that energy efficiency is so obvious and so popular is because you can't send, you know, you can't send buildings overseas and have them <laughs> retrofitted, right? We do all that work right here. And I think it has been a huge challenge in the solar industry because everyone's arguing about grid parity is too expensive, so how do we reduce the cost, right? How do we reduce the cost? And that always frightens me because reducing the cost typically means lower wages, right? And that's not what we want to see, but we have seen this precipitous decline in solar prices. We also have seen, in a number of cases, um, manufacturing returning from overseas, um, which is uh, tremendous. And some of that has to do with um, quality control. Uh, some of that has to do with um, uh, an innovation economy where people are finally remembering that what happens in manufacturing is not that you dream it up somewhere on a computer and then somebody across the world executes it, but that that innovation and happening happens on the floor where people are making things and you want to be there with people making things so that they can tell you what works better. So there's some interesting things happening in the manufacturing sector that way and I know there's been a lot of studies, um, the Germans have done a lot of cost of labor um, studies to figure out what are more efficient ways for labor to make things, so make things not cheaply, make high quality things. Um, and one of the things that the one of the good things that the Department of Energy is doing is trying to figure out a way to reduce the cost of solar without um, reducing wages. And one of the big ways to do that is, to, is regulatory reform, right? So one of the hugest costs in solar is not the wages of production workers, but it's the red tape that people have to cut through. Um, so there's a lot of work that's being done on the regulatory front to try and reduce balance of system costs. Um, but, but these are enormous questions, right? And this is the question where I keep coming back to, we also have to think about 
how we can keep a standard of living where perhaps we are not going to see manufacturing wages return to the golden days of the post-war years where that was a solid middle class living. So how can we maintain that quality of life um, in a wage world that looks very different? Kind of related to that, um, just wanted to ask, um, also sort of do a plug for everyone in the room. Um, have you heard at all about uh, high altitude wind power, which I think is a really interesting topic. I mean, one of the whole things with, uh, with solar energy is you know, energy efficiency, you know, how much do you get from it versus how you know, much energy you put in in construction and maintenance. Um, you know, how, how much does it cost you know, per kilowatt hour? Um, and I can't remember the exact figures, but I've, I've looked into um, high altitude wind power, which you know, as opposed to you know, conventional wind is uh, really low to the ground. It only sort of scrapes the, you know, the, the very bottom of um, what are really some very, very uh, uh, high altitude, or sorry, high velocity winds that you get at, at higher altitudes. So basically it's, um, you know, people figure out how to, uh, how to, you know, make turbines that you can put aloft. And there are studies that, um, or initial tests have found that you can make, uh, you know, renewable and sustainable energy with this very cheaply. Um, mm -hmm. So I just want to ask if you'd... If you'd uh, right. I no, I have not been following that part of, of the uh, wind industry, although it is fascinating. There's, like, there is new technology coming out every day. Wind, solar. I mean, do you know that solar, uh, you know, will be painted on the side of your house? I mean, it's just, it's incredible what they're doing. But I should emphasize that this is, we are not in need of technological breakthrough. Wind and solar are... Uh, if you level the subsidy field, are at grid parity. They cost almost the same as fossil fuels. And we have the technology to bring them to scale now. We have to make some political choices about where we're going to invest our capital, which Billy Parrish is going to talk about in the video you're about to see. So, um, so while that is fascinating and the science geek in me loves that stuff, I'm more concerned with how are we going to get people uh, investing in the, the capacity that we have for wind and solar uh, right now. But thank you. That's a. It's. It is fascinating, right? Yeah, you know, it's easier if it's like you know, three or four times as uh, as energy efficient as oil is right now. It's just as, uh, right. Anyway, I'm, I'm fine. I should say that um, just on a personal note, I turned on wind when I went on a bike trip across Spain, and I realized that they were really smart about siting. And every time you see these windmills that were so lovely, you knew you had to ride up and over that mountaintop that they were on. And so really, solar fan, solar fan. I cursed windmills many, many times in addition to jousting at them. So <laughs> thanks. But um, if there's nothing else urgent, perhaps we watch the video, and then we can discuss that after. How's that? Um. <laughs>